presentation uh, from the CD. I am Boima S. Kamar, Minister of Finance and Development Planning, Destiny. My name is James Dabo Jala. I'm the Commissioner General Designate for the Liberia Revenue Authority. Beginning with the Senator's introduction, I'm Senator Prince Kemu Moy of Bond County, the Chairman of the Committee on Ways, Maze, Funders, Development Planning. I'm Creighton Old Duncan. Senator of Sino County, co-chairman on the Committee of Ways, Means, Finance, and the Budget. Senator Bodo Tanya Senator Bodo Tanya Bako, Senator Bodo Tanya Bako, Senator Bodo Tanya Bako, Thank you, thank you, colleagues. Uh, so we'll ask our colleagues, uh, Senator Jopo, to read what we have agreed on as our working tools to guide this uh, hearing, Senator Jopo. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chair, uh, distinguished Senator. Uh, the nominee uh, will be given each 15 minutes to make a presentation to the committee. And after that, each senator will be given five minutes to interact with the nominee. And now, uh, <laughs> and then uh, we will take um, five questions each of concern from the public for each of the nominee, and that those concerns will be written and given to the sergeant uh, and we send to the chairman thanks uh, to have the public interaction in the process. Thank you. Thank you. Our double for that piece of work is done. <coughs> so with that said, we will now take uh, the Minister of Destiny, the Minister of Finance and Development Planning. Oh, sorry, sorry. Thank you. That's why we will have four heads in the room. No, yeah, you should do your opening statement and then do the speech. Well, thank you, our colleagues, for being present. <clears throat> uh, Mr. <clears throat> nominee of the uh, Ministry of Finance and also Honorable Jala, the, the uh, nominee for LRA. We'd like to welcome you to this chamber of the Senate and to this committee. Uh, all eyes are on you because the position that you have uh, been nominated for <clears throat> is very key in our country. We <clears throat> are at this transitioning at the, this transitioning period, and uh, <clears throat> our people are waiting 
debate in the entire country. Just looking at the two of them. Yeah. What
We also extend profound thanks to this honorable committee and the entire setting for the opportunity to appear before this august body for confirmation year. Distinguished Senators, our years of service to our nation has been and will always continue to be characterized by the fear of God, unfettered love for the motherland, and respect for all people marked by tolerance and humility. Honorable Senators, special recognition goes to my wife, Antonia Nadia Satus, sitting on my far left, Kamara, and children who have been the pillar and source of strength in everything I do. Indeed, a blessing and a rare find. The Lord has gifted us with five beautiful children. We come to this call with over 22 years of work experience, both at home and abroad, dealing with monetary, fiscal, development planning, and innovative financing for health issues at regional and continental levels. At the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, UNEPA, West Africa Regional Office, we help to implement, monitor, and evaluate the report on the Agenda 2030 and the African Union 2063 in West Africa, assisted with the formulation of ECOWAS Vision 2050 framework document, supported the implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Area, CFTA, in the West Africa region, and also coordinated impact assessment of COVID-19 and recovery response among the others. Our PACs at the African Union Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Africa CDC, included focusing on the facilitation of partnerships between the Africa CDC and finance and economic planning communities, developing strategy and identifying the best practices to engage relevant stakeholders, to leverage financing for health, supporting the health economics and financing program at the Africa CDC, to develop context relevant to help financing mechanism to boost investment in public health. As we seek to build a vibrant economy that is inclusive and where jobs are sustainable, the time for all Liberians to put our nation first is now. We must confront and meet the foe with valor and pretending. The main reason for our economic backwardness is the old economic model, which relies mainly on exploitation of raw materials, especially iron ore, rubber, and other minerals, with limited emphasis on economic diversification, which usually paves the way for industrialization of an economy. We must be intentional about innovation and thinking outside the box. And outside the box thinking, for example, should consider the Liberia's program with the IMF should be one that should go side by side with a robust, coordinated, and integrated framework that maps out where resources are to be spent for optimal results. The new economic model that should resonate with all Liberians, especially policymakers, can be coined in the slogan, Made in Liberia, a commitment. By giving the private sector center stage in policy decision making as the engine for growth and development. The time has come to move away from government being the largest employer to the private sector as the anchor for sustainable job creation. Government's policy should intentionally support domestic value addition with Liberian entrepreneurs leading the charge. In this regard, the government should work with our development partners to ensure that development assistance be aligned with our national development plan. A big thank you to our development partners 
for the continued support to the government and our people. Tangible investment largely in agriculture value chain, where smallholders are supported smartly, will be a good start. This is the soft side from my perspective. The heavy lifting of Liberia's structural transformation can only be guaranteed when most of the borrowing go towards addressing the binding constraints, which includes high cost of electricity and limited paved roads, especially along the growth corridors, and strengthening the financial system for more support to development projects. The absence of a capital market in Liberia is another problem raising needed capital for development something which requires more by the government. We must know what we want, agree on what we want, and just do it. Distinguished senators, the over 16 years of distinguished public sector experience <coughs> dealing with monetary and fiscal matters right, and of Liberia as Deputy Governor for Economic Policy and Minister of Finance and Development Planning, among others, coupled with my recent experience outside Liberia as a consultant with the UAECA and the African Union, dealing with macroeconomic and public health financing issues, clearly make me in best faith to serve again as Minister of Finance to steal our nation's finances. When confirmed as Minister, we will work hard with your collaboration and support to reposition our economy on a sustainable path of growth and form by a depending new national development plan that places more emphasis on agriculture, roads, and education. This will mean working to secure and sustain financing for critical investments and assuring the optimization of public resources where efficiency gains are clearly in the interest of all our people. Distinguished Senators, it is important to note that we will be taking over the nation's finances at an extraordinarily challenging time. The effects of COVID-19 and the Ukraine-Russia war on the global economy still linger with implications for global growth and demand for commodity exports from Liberia. There have been issues of low economic growth in the last six years with an average of 1.3% double-digit inflationary pressure on the back of exchange rate depreciation, and frequent recast of the national budget on account of underperforming revenue. The fiscal balance of the government that we are inheriting is, a, is in a very bad state. The report of 40 million as the GOL's consolidated account balance as of January 19, 2024, it's not supported by the facts. The balances reported by the CBL as of the same date was 20.5 million. Liberian dollars balances converted and added to the US dollar balance. Highly encumbered, not 40 million. When it comes to the dual consolidated account balances, there can be no commingling of balances of the old fiscal year i.e. FY 2023 and the new fiscal year 2024. Consistent with section 34 of the amended PMM Act of 2009. This means all encumbrances and commitment on claims on the existing order account, which in this case is the FY 2023 consolidated account balance. Records show that the MFDP borrowed 18 million from the CBL to fund payroll for November and December <coughs> of 2023. We will give greater clarity on this matter as we proceed. New borrowings that further widen the budget deficit, section 16 <coughs> of the amendment restatement of the PFM Act of 2009 on computation of budget surplus or deficit. As we have been made aware that Liberia has been sanctioned due to lack of payment of dues to the African Union and the African Development Bank, 
In addition, a default in payment of about 650,000 to the European Investment Bank is preventing the disbursement of over 13 million for the San Nicolino Patrol Road. Now, other institutions have reached out to us because of government non-payment of interest principal permission to several international organizations, including Export Import Bank of China, OPEC Fund for International Development, and the International Fund for Agriculture. These are just a few examples of the issues we are inheriting. A full fiscal review to determine the 2023 fiscal outturn will be done swiftly and outcomes be made known to this honorable body and the public when confirmed. Nonetheless, amidst these challenges, we will work with the Liberian Revenue Authority to strengthen revenue collection and help improve tax administration. Domestic resource mobilization must take center stage through innovation and at the same time closing loopholes and minimizing other influences affecting revenue collection. Key emphasis must be on digital technology in revenue collection. On the expenditure front, in these challenging economic times, the government will have to take appropriate austerity measures by shifting resources toward priority sectors such as roads, agriculture, health, education, and security. Distinguished Senators, public sector investment projects, i.e. capital expenditure, should increase to at least 15% as a share of the 2024 national budget. In year one, under which the Biden administration has come. This is one of the areas we can work together to improve the well-being of the Liberian people. In conclusion, we once again thank His Excellency President Joseph Newman Boyka for our preferment and assure the Honorable Senate Ways, Men's Finance and Budget Committee that we will work with the National Legislature and our development partners in strengthening our public financial management system creating an enabling environment to do business in Liberia, and placing the nation's finances on a sustainable path to deliver the investment needed for economic growth and job creation. We now submit our presentation for your record and take any question you may have. Sergeant? Yes. We have the uh, presentation of the minister designate. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now take the uh, second and final presentation from the Commissioner General of the Liberia Revenue Authority. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, support chair, and members of the budget and finance committee. Please permit me to stand on the protocols already established by the Finance Minister designate. Like the Finance Minister, I want to extend profound thanks and appreciation to the President of Liberia for my preferment and want to assure him and this August body as well as all of our people of my utmost in ensuring that legitimate revenues are collected and that we have efficiency in those revenue collections to ensure that our people get the best value for our public resources. Thank you also, Senators, for this opportunity for me to present my strategic vision in leading the Revenue Authority, which essentially is going to focus on three major prompts institutional strengthening, revenue expansion, and governance improvement. On the institutional strengthening piece, you will agree with me that the foundation of an effective revenue authority lies in robust institutional structure. I will be proposing a revision to the framework 
that we currently have so that we can have transformation in elevating the authority to grant it a full autonomy status. This, in my belief, will be able to solve a lot of the operational and dissident problems that exist with the current CIMA autonomous structure that the authority currently has. You will also all recall that when the decision was made a couple of years ago to detach the Department of Budget from the Ministry of Finance, I'm sorry, the Department of Revenue from the Ministry of Finance and create the Library of Revenue Authority, the thinking at the time was that this will be a five-year experiment and the hope was that once we got it right, to eventually graduate the authority to a full autonomy status. Even though there has been marked improvement, and this is not to say there have not been challenges, but the uh, granting the authority, the full autonomy, is still an action that is overdue and outstanding. This full autonomy will empower the authority to make strategic decisions swiftly, allocate resources more effectively, and be accountable for delivering results. We will also work at building, restoring the merit-based system, which is paramount to ensure that promotions, appointments, etc., are based on competence and performance, thereby fostering a culture of excellence and integrity. On the revenue expansion prompt, we know that revenue generation is the basis for our nation's fiscal health. And as you heard the president in his annual message to the nation, and also as you just heard from the finance minister, most of these services that each of them have committed to supporting for our people rely heavily, if not entirely, on our revenue generating capacity. In so doing, there are certain key aspects that we want to focus on in our revenue generation framework. The first one is we need to look at our exemption regime you know, and see whether there are efficiencies that we could deploy. And for that, we will work with the Ministry of Finance, yourselves and the uh, presidency, as well as the National Investment Commission, the Ministry of Commerce and other actors to ensure that we can be able to optimize you know, and see the relevance of some of those incentives and how we could be able to rationalize them so that we can be able to increase revenue input, I mean revenue intake. We also will work with you, as well as with other stakeholders, in help in decentralizing revenue collection. We know that the last legislature passed the Local Government Act, and as a part of that act, you know, we need to decentralize some of these revenue functions. Such things as real estate property tax collection, as well as other tax and service and, and fees will need to be devolved to the municipalities for greater efficiency, as well as for revenue sharing. Another area that we intend to focus on is revising our consumer tax system. Currently, as you all know, the current legislature, there is a bill before the legislature for the value added tax law. The pilot that LRA has conducted with that shows that there's multiple increased potential in domestic revenue mobilization. You know, if we were able to get this one piece and get the full cooperation of all stakeholders in the process. So we will be working with you in the Ministry of Finance as well as through the President's office to make sure that this bill can be passed into law. You know, then it will give us the empowerment to be able to generate more revenue. And I agree with the Minister that we need to deploy innovative solutions 
and we need to implement technologies to enhance efficiency and effectiveness of our operation. Now I'd like to lay more emphasis on the efficiency and the effectiveness part because there are you know, uh, reports that in our revenue generation mechanisms, there may be some need for improvement. There may be revenue losses, waste and abuse that we think that by in deploying technology, we can help to minimize some of those you know, uh, uh, waste and abuse. In terms of governance, for a revenue authority to succeed, it must operate within a transparent and accountable governance system. My commitment is to foster strong relationships with various stakeholders, including the Ministry of Finance, the legislature, the judiciary, the business com community, civil society, and other actors, through an open dialogue and collaboration. I believe we can ensure that our policies and practices are not only effective, but also fair and transparent for the benefit of all of our systems. I come to you with nearly three decades of senior managerial experience in both the public and private sector. My records are very clear. Um, it includes work in the private sector. We oversaw the governance of Ecobank Liberia at a time when it was at a stage of almost collapsing. We managed to turn it around. And for the many decades that Ecobank has been in Liberia, it had never generated any return for its shareholders. But under our leadership, we were able to turn Ecobank around from loss making to profit making. We also spent four years at the Public Procurement and Concessions Commission. And in that role, I have the privilege of working with many of you who are still in this legislature. Because many of you were in this legislature at the time. And we all worked to strengthen public procurement. We develop systems, deploy technologies that give greater transparency and accountability. You know, we also have worked in other areas, in academia. Currently, we have the Carter Center where we are implementing you know, development-related projects related to peace and security as well as enhancing our democracy. In conclusion, my vision for the Revenue Authority is one where institutional strength, revenue expansion, and robust governance come together to create an organization that is not only efficient and effective, but also trusted and respected by the people it serves. With your support, I am confident that we can achieve these goals and contribute significantly to our nation's prosperity. Before I end, I would like to uh, make special recognition of my wife, Sada. Sada, raise your hand. Yeah, I want to um, extend my special gratitude to her because she has been my partner from junior high school. Wow. Yes, we were in junior high together and we used to be sneaking from our parents. We were the same age. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So she has been my pillar of strength and my support. And she has made a lifetime commitment to me and will continue to be so. I want to thank her. I want to thank our children, unlike the minister that has only five, you see? Yeah, we have about two dozen. <laughs> <laughs> and we are very thankful. So I'd like to submit, Mr. Chairman and Honorable Senators, I'm sending by for more questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for the two presentations. Like our colleague said, the Secretary on this committee will give five minutes each. Two of them five minutes for interactive. Yeah, five minutes. That was what we said yesterday. So it's 10. So it's 10. We agree, Polish? 
We agree with that? Maximum. Maximum, okay. Okay, no problem. Okay, so we'll take 10 minutes interaction for each senator to the both. Yeah? Yeah, to the both of uh, you. We have them asked to give the first preference to our protein in Meritus. I think he has some other obligation. So we'll begin with uh, Senator Chi to give his uh, questions or concerns in 10 minutes. Thank you. Let me work on my. My former colleague from the university, Professor Gala, back to government, and the junior brother, back to government as well. I believe you guys have the requisite experience to bring to, to the table. So the minister was speaking, and as soon as I brought gold, diamond, iron, ore, and my eyes started opening, so that's my area. So he said that. Uh, the whole mother depends on the traditional export of coal, diamonds, iron ore, and rubber. That's the whole mother. The new model should be diversification. For me, I've heard this over and over and over. When government goes, when government comes, see economic model. I believe. Besides diversification, what we need to do is to put in money in these sectors, revenue generating sectors, and improve on them greatly. Because anytime you read the bulletin from the central bank, when there's a growth, you will read that primarily due to exports of gold, growth in that sector. So there are sectors we need to, to, to spend money on and make them more profitable. Let me go now to my inquiry. Several years back, we had two distinct ministries, Ministry of Planning and Economic Affairs, Ministry of Finance and Ministry of Finance. We merged them. Since we merged them, people from, from the public sector and from the public, general public, have been complaining. They say the Ministry of Planning the activities are all vanished. Do you agree with the minister? Yeah, interactive. Uh, thank you, Senator Chair. And um, it's good that you brought this up, and we've been in conversation around this issue. Certainly, I, I align myself with that sentiment that the structure, even the current structure of the Ministry of Finance and Development Planning, and the manner and form in which it positions the development planning section of the ministry uh, obviously has to change. And, and in conversation with professional colleagues, my professional uh, and personal take on this matter would be to revert. There is a need to give full recognition to the development planning piece of our nation. It cannot be subsumed in the way it is currently. And, and in that regard, I, 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 I certainly believe the, the attempt to move our country in a direction that is solidified, sustained, it must be informed by the planning piece, and that cannot be uh, a place of second guessing. And the relevant training, because everything that has to do with total factor productivity, informing the development planning piece, the extent to which the right labor force contribution, all of those will have to be properly planned. And that means uh, just having a minister, a deputy minister for budget and development planning, uh, that's not the way to proceed. And certainly we say it has to change. Thank you. We'll work with you uh, very soon. And like God's grace point confirmed, we think those will be one of the areas for legislative reform. Thank you. So my next question goes to both of you. Prof talked about uh, the green generation. Okay. 
Virginia. Okay. Virginia. Okay. Virginia. Okay. Virginia. Okay. Virginia. I want to discuss the incentive agreement scheme. There are two types of incentive agreement on the threshold. Some are issued by the Ministry of Finance Development Planning without the legislative approbation and some with the legislative approbation during the threshold. And uh, the public is also concerned. The original thought was good, but uh, tax experts feel that uh, we are losing. We are losing from this very essential agreement that have been executed, that have been signed with the government. For many reasons, the only reason is that of uh, uh, proper monitoring. Do you still want to proceed with the grant of incentive, or do you want to get rid of that? I think this is, this is as part of the, the transition uh, engagement and as, as a serving the capacity as the cluster lead for the economic and financial governance cluster, uh, we went into a more detailed deep dive when it came to the existing tax incentive regime. And from all the conversation and the advice from the technical experts, we need to institute, like now, a review of the entire tax incentive regime and treat them on a case-by-case -case basis and look at the economic benefits to the nation, its people, in terms of what returns have we gained from these incentives. So on a case-by-case -case basis, it's important that we do that as soon as possible. Uh, and let that process re reflect the extent to which revenue generation that will come out of the tax expenditure, which we see as a loss, uh, uh, can be reversed and ensure that over the last six years, 12 years, averaging 600 million in domestic resource revenue as a government through our budget, we believe these are some of the areas we have to look at again. So that at the end of the day, these will be part of the area we are talking about minimizing those things that are creating some form of loss in the system. And the growth in revenue, if we just do it right, automating, making sure that the middle layer uh, of which these incentives are, are Awarded. So from both the Ministry of Finance, LRA, we will sit together and review these things so that in two years from now, with the right changes in the incentive regime, our revenue collection capacity could be more than one billion. Just doing it right. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Minister. Uh, Senator, please permit me to go back you know, and just to provide some historical context on how Liberia has become trapped in these whole incentive schemes where we negotiate you know, with each investor and then we give up so much. Um, when the Ministry of Planning and Economic Affairs, which was the subject of the first question, existed, and the last minister turned out to be uh, Senator Corning, I worked with Senator uh, Minister Corney at the time as his deputy minister for sectoral and development planning. And so we were in on most of the conversations you know, with all the investments that were coming in at that time. At the time, Liberia, we had just come from the Civil War. This was in President Salif's first term. The political economy at the time was for us to be able to make Liberia, one of the key considerations was for us to make Liberia to be attractive to foreign direct investments. We, and I think together we did a pretty good job. That's because the news about Liberia at the time were things to the effects of being cannibals, you know, being brutal, a brutal civil war. I mean, I don't want to remind people. But those 
that was the situation at the time. And this is what led us to begin because one of the fears, every time we have private meeting, you know, it's been many years now, I think I can say this in public, the concerns on the government side was that if you hold these people too hard, maybe they will go to Sierra Leone, maybe they will go to Gambia, maybe they will go to other places. And we need to prove that Liberia is stable, Liberia is safe. Are those considerations still the same right today? I don't think so. I think we've made tremendous improvement. And I agree with the minister, this is about the time for us to review and see whether that's the regime that we want to go. My view on that is that we strengthen our tax regime, our revenue code, and make it so that you know, there is a general rule that applies to everyone and anyone. So that investors don't have to come here and be scrambling to meet with people here and there and be trying to find lobbyists and people who can introduce them. No, we have the general rule. And then like the minister said, in extraneous cases under that regime, then we can look at case by case. But in the meantime, I think part of the review that we need to conduct is to look at the performance of all those we've given these incentives to. Because many times when you read these agreements, you see lofty things that they are supposed to do. You know? But when you go into you know, the areas of operation and the things they are supposed to do, you know, then you don't see anything. You know, there's one particular case in point. Right now, one you know, uh, 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 mining concessionaire currently has inundated their communities with jingles and announcements and everything on radio. They're about to build housing for people. They'll build housing for communities. But this is something you should have done since 15 years ago. So as a people, as a people, as part of that review process, we really need to analyze these performances, you know? And, and yes, we do need the jobs that they will create. But believe you me, these are business people. They will not run away. What we need to do is when we set up these systems, let's allow the system to work. If we don't allow the system to work, then we undermine it ourselves. And this is where we got to have that discipline across all of government. We also have to ensure that we strengthen our judiciary, you know, because as chairman of EcoBank, I mean, I came full center with the challenges that we have in the judiciary and how disappointing it is for me to convince my shareholders to pump more money into Liberia. I had to make several trips to Togo, to Lomé, we were meeting all over the place, you know, because what? I mean, broad day cases, unaggregable cases, we will lost it in the court, you know? So we need to be able to strengthen our judiciary, work with the judiciary to make sure that investors can have assurances that once they invest their money, you know, they will be able to be protected under, under the law. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. sorry. You got to get to the point, yeah. Financing and, and no agreement. Minister, in your statement, you said the government assistance should, should be aligned with our real national needs. The public also agree with that. In fact, they have been telling us that so the rules we take, whether they are beneficial to the country. People sometimes complain that so the panels bring the money and the very fast. All other bodies go on over. What's your thoughts on that? Thank you, Senator Chair. So on this, the time has come in terms of just framing and it's something that for all of us to just reflect. That in the space of six years, what can we show for for an increase in the public debt stock from 878 million to 2.2 million? An increase of over 1.3 billion. What can we show? So that period has come. Uh, we should ask ourselves, can we see 1.3 billion in agriculture where we invested in critical agriculture infrastructure, equipment, training capacity that we generate because studies have shown if we just do agriculture right, 
bring in factory DNA that adds value addition, for example, say the rice we eat, how do we do it differently? Cassava we eat, how do we do it differently? Not just only for domestic consumption, but for export. So these are the critical areas in rules. We have 10,000 kilometers of rule as the projected target in our country for the last 18 years. We have only been able to do 8.7% of that. So where has 1.3 billion been going? So these are just some critical questions. At this point in time, when we say realign our long quest to the National Development Plan. So if we are agreeing going forward, that a rescue mission that emphasizes an arrest that focuses on agriculture, rural, education. That means my request to say in this first year, let the national budget at least be seen nothing less than 15% towards public sector investment project. If we do it, these are the enablers, rural, agriculture, ICT will be the enablers that will take us to the quest for becoming a middle-income country of a double-digit growth. So certainly, as we work on what comes next regarding the, the new National Development Plan, we are saying the budget going forward should be aligned to the National Development Plan informing the way the budget is structured. And then loans are expected to be taken. Thank you. We will now take Senator Mangier. Thank you. 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 Obama, are you the Obama and Kamara who was the deputy governor of Central Bank for, for, for economic affairs? Are you the same Obama Kamara? Yes, this is the same Obama Kamara. Are you the Obama Kamara, the minister of finance? Yeah. And this is the same Obama Kamara. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Are you the, the are you the current lead lead of, for the economic management team of President Tessa Walker? Then, the then cluster on economic and financial government. Okay, so thank you. Are you the same budget? You know, before I come to you, I don't want to, before I come to the minister, Professor Prof, you just made mention of the judiciary. Are you saying the issue of the judiciary is the issue of incompetence or the issue of corruption? Uh, thank you for that question, Senator. The judiciary itself, the Chief Justice, in her series of opening statements at every court opening, has highlighted issues in the judiciary. And those issues include, you know, the ones that... You know, What's your personal opinion? My, my personal opinion is that there's a lot of improvement that needs to be made within the judiciary, you know, just as there are in, in, uh, improvements that need to be made or in the, the executive. The, problem? the problems could be multiple folds. You know, it could be capacity constraint, it could be resource constraint. You know, we operate in a resource constraint environment, you know. So what we need to do as a people, the point I was making is that we need to take a holistic approach. You know, if we're going to review and make sure that we can get the dividends of the reforms that we are engendering. We have to ensure that all the different aspects of government works in a way, in the case of the judiciary, in a way that can restore the confidence, you know, or enhance the confidence of the private sector in the judiciary. Yeah, well, my, can my, I, right, right now, that is a bit wanting. You want to, you want to say something? Yes, sir. Yeah, in that, in that direction. Yeah. So, our recent engagement with the Bankers Association, an issue especially with debt collection in the judiciary is a concern for the commercial bank. To the extent where a person who has debt for a given banking institution would take 
the bank to court and the judge rules against the bank. So it's going to be responsible for that. So it comes back again to making sure that people who are seated within the judiciary, within the courts, they should dispense justice. So you think they're making a wrong judgment, correct? And by that fact, we clearly that's an issue that must be addressed. Bribery or something? Well, I can sit here and say, oh yes, they took this for corruption. But the fact that the industry is seeing this as an alarming situation, it takes away investment from our country and even for the extension of credit that we are so desiring for our labor in this country. You are going to the LRA, this, and maybe a Mr. O'Connor will prepare you a Mr. O'Connor before. There's something on the LRA called custom use of fees. How is it being used? Maybe Boyma can explain that also. How is it being used by the LRA? Is there something that you can like What's the order? What's the order? Honorable Senator, please address the minister properly. Mr. Destiny, Mr. Destiny, maybe you can address that uh, because you were former minister before. Um, the LRA Commission Destiny, this is a new fee for you, probably the minister can explain that because you were minister of finance before. So I want to understand what is the purpose of the cost of use of, use of fee? Is it part of the national budget or is it something that costs on your control? And use it anyway you want to use it. Anything that is being done in the context of revenue collected by LRA must be reflected as part of the envelope for the national budget. So I will respond in that now. Okay, so it means that the national budget, they, they come in budget with, we see reflected, the economy of you reflected, correct? Everything that borders on revenue collection will and must be captured in the national budget resource envelope. Okay, thank you. Okay, I, I want you to explain to me, Senator, if you're okay with that, because... I mean, I won't bother you because you're just going there. Okay. <laughs> Three more minutes. Three more minutes, no? Yeah, yeah. What, ten minutes? Three minutes, seven minutes. Okay, but uh, well, my plea, uh, nominee, please, please, go on. Sorry, Lord, I let him up, God, brother, and I don't have time anymore. So, please, please, go on. I have a great interest in the quarter million dollar issue. And you just mentioned it. When you went, the reason why I asked whether you were the lead for the economic management thing that collected the information, the reason why I asked you because you work at the bank, so you have both knowledge in fiscal and, and, and the monetary management. I want to know, explain to us, what is the real story? It said that as of January 7, 17, it said that whatever on incumbent or incumbent, did you also meet a laboratory our company at the bank? Let him ask his question. What's the order? Yeah, yeah, what's the order? The order here is that the, the plenary voted. Uh, no, it is in So the, the, the order is not sustained. He made mention of that in his statement. And there is a public hearing. So the public the public need to know exactly what, what, what the answers are. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Mr. Minister, you answer. Thank you, Senator McGill. So on this matter, you know we've been hearing several issues that have been discussed in the press. As we led the Economic and Financial Governance Cluster, Central Bank was one of those institutions we engaged. We had both on-site engagement and also receipt of documents. 
among which was report on the consolidated balance. What was reported on the 21st by the former President Weir in his address reflecting 220 million <coughs> and in the net international reserve and 40 million in the consolidated balance. <coughs> we heard that report for the net international reserve as report received, that's what we saw, 220.2 million, that's fine. For the 40 million, we went back to the CBA after that uh, announcement, and we asked the central bank, are you aware of the reporting of 40 million in the consolidated balance, as was reported by the former president? They indicated the governor in that meeting, DG for operation in that meeting, indicated they did not supply that information. So that was the first thing we took note of. Share with us what then is the information. The presenters, the submission. If you look at the submission, that 40 million violated the Public Financial Management Act, the restated Public Financial Management Act of 2009. They combined. There was a co-mingling of the fiscal year 2023 balances and fiscal year 2024. That means you, the Public Financial Management Act will have you and there are sections separate. So, and when you're reporting on revenue balances, say for 2023, it must reflect all collections of revenue for that period. So when you heard the president report on 20.5 of around 21 million, we had to say 2022 was the year in review that he was reporting on. 2023 is the year in review reporting on. So when you do that, like Brent dollar balances, US dollar balances, you put them together, brings you to around the 20.5, 21 million giving exchange information. So what is important to let the public know, in December, the central bank indicated to us they were under pressure and the Ministry of Finance, the government, drew down 80 million from the reserve to pay salaries for November and December. That's one. If you disaggregate this 21 million in our conversation with them, portion of the reserve room, around the 80 million, 7.7 .7 million is on one of the lines called payroll. And we inquire, but we want to pay for January. Why can we use it? The response was, this is part of the borrowing. So we hold it. So we hold it, and we say, when you do that, that means, in terms of actual revenue collection, you can be putting debt into the actual revenue basket for the period 2023. So if you take out even 7 million, it further reduces the actual balance. So on this matter, we'll be calling for an audit of that process, just to make sure that the rest story is true, because it is even in violation of Section 36 of the Public Financial Management Act that any new debt must have come to you first for your approbation, which was not done. And the second thing, it also violated that financing of budget deficit must have been included in the budget for fiscal year 2022. Was that done? No one knows. And what was the basis to have gone to the central bank? Especially on an IMF program that says there should be no monetary financing. And the central bank chose to take 80 million. So, Granted, if it's in 40 million, you give me 40 million, and you took away 80 million from me. That means you're already in the red. I'm making clarity so on this matter so that people can be. We're not going to investigation. I'm question to you. No, I'm saying, are you telling me? I'm question what I want to know. What I want to know is that when I'm 40 million, what I want to know is what are not 40 million out there? I don't, I'm not talking about the mechanics. What are the boundary law? The boundary law. I want to know what are not 40 million out there. What are you saw like grand dollar components? When you say co-mingling, 
It means that there were two different uh, 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 figures. Fiscal year. Fiscal year. Fiscal year. And you, I, I don't want to know yeah. whether there were librarians that were confident. Yes, they yes. The report they provided us has both librarians and And what was that report? That both librarians and you and what did that, when did it come from to? That was our number okay. two. So, for the record, GL balance report received the US dollar is 15,967,236.86 as reported to us. The librarian dollar company is 1 billion, 55 million, 348,719 converted. Which average we use came to five million, and when you add those two, it's well. However, in this fifty million, we suspect because from the response Is that a payroll line item. Okay, no, you seven have to seven million. Okay, okay, okay. 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 It's it's only one thing. I hope you answer the question. It's okay. okay. Yeah, they answer the answer answer question. Twenty. On this one, yes, twenty point three. And you you have to take my, 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 my last question to you. What was the time? The time no, 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 my target is off. The yeah, last question, quick. The last question. The last question. Uh, last question. Uh, do you support the free tuition program? As a Liberian, wanting quality education for all, a free tuition policy, is something that, yes, we will want to do. However, the question is, how free is free? Let there be some issues that should be put around in terms of rate fencing. Who qualifies for it? On what basis people qualify? Well, yeah, well, I'm, go six for the I'm coming on me asking the question. In my, I, I'm at time. We don't know. I don't want to answer to all my time. Are you aware of Article 6 says that to provide math education to all citizens? Yes, so it should be done in a structured way. It must come my to the budget. Is, what I'm not sure now, my question is, do you support the free education program, yes or no? I will support the free education that is done in a structured manner through the national budget, through Ministry of Education, in a way that benefits people who deserve it. Thank you very much. What takes a Brown, Senator DeLong in that order. Senator Brown, Senator DeLong. Yeah. Let the brown go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me join you quickly to congratulate the two nominees. Tamara uh, and Mara And I'm proud to see that they, they have been accompanied here by their wives and children. You know, normally when we do confirmations here, we see people from some choir that just come. Go back. But having families, your families coming here for complimentation, it tells us that we are together in this thing. So congratulations. The two of you uh, once served in government before you left briefly, and now you're back. Whilst you were away, and I'm glad that Ramujala made mention of the local government act. But in addition to that local government act. There were some other instruments that we, the, the government and the legislature, we the legislature, we felt that we needed to decentralize our fiscal policies and measures to increase revenue, especially to put money to finance local government in line with the local government act. But the challenge we have faced over the years since the approval of this act in 2018 is how do we implement this law or these laws? So I listened to Honorable Jala, but in concrete terms, Honorable Minister and Honorable Minister designated by Honorable Jala, can you please tell us in concrete terms how do you intend to collaborate so that? Um, we can operationalize the two laws within your respective managers. 
That's the first question. How do you intend to operate, op op operationalize the two, the, these, the instruments, the financial instruments that we pass, so that they can benefit our people as we envisage them in the arts? That's my first question to the two of you. Anybody can start first. Thank you. I think on this, when we left up in 2018, the way that this process started, at least to give life to it and hold more meaning, was to the county service center established across the county. And that is, in my mind, I believe, if we just strengthen the county service center for the right support, uh, and then a incentive around which people can be assured that if they commit themselves in those county service centers around the country, that would be a way through the, the in which the revenue sharing schemes. Uh, Let me be very specific. Uh, if you read the local government act, uh, chapter four talks about financing local government, and we list a number of taxes that should be collected at the local level, at the level of the county, at the level of the cities, and a portion of that should be left there. My question is, how do you intend, how will you oper operationalize these measures? So, and that's what I'm saying. So the administrative structure around that, mm -hmm. as long as you, those services for birth certificate and what have you, as long as they are related to revenue generation then, in terms of what they do, it is where then it has to be marked up clearly. When you collect it, just as we do for LRA, mm -hmm. this portion comes to you. And we think we should just strengthen that institutional structure and start from there. Right. So let me hear from LRA because everything is still coming to the consolidated account. Yeah. So, so Senator, uh, thank you. This is a very good question. You know, uh, in my uh, brief consultations with the technicians and uh, uh, senior management of LRA these past couple of days, I have been informed that LRA is act has actually embarked on a pilot, you know, for domestic revenue mobilization in Grand Bassa County. So we are in one of the districts where we are piloting the collection of uh, domestic taxes. So our hope is to be able to expand that. And some of the things we intend to do is to deploy technology, which will then help to increase our efficiency. So now that the, the budget has gone back to the executive, if confirmed, I'm going to work seriously with the team at LRA so that we can be able to you know, direct you know, some financing into that area so that based on the outcomes that we'll get from this pilot in Grand Basel, we can expand from one district to other districts as well as expand in other counties. So we already have you know, uh, this pilot framework going and we intend to build on that, the learning experiences we will get and will continue. Of course, the service centers, you know, has been one of the key achievements I think that we made as a people, and it will be good for us to continue that. Unfortunately, we apparently didn't work out the financing mechanism properly for these service centers. So what was happening is that the resources, because our resources essentially are still local, I mean centralized in yeah. Monrovia. So, so this, this new regime, what it's going to do is that it's going to give us the well with her to be able to you know, work with the municipalities and local government in collecting taxes and fees, and then it will all go in a, in a consolidated account. Mm -hmm. But in the proportion that the legislature will agree will be automatically transferred to the effective local government account so that there can be transparency and accountability in the process. Thank you, sir. I had a question that uh, in the, uh, Chair, former pro tem, asked briefly. It has to do with the, the reform measures in post conflict Liberia, where we merge the Ministry of Finance with the Ministry of Economic Affairs. Uh, and as you rightfully say, and as you acknowledge, the, 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 the planning and development department is, 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 has been wanted over the years. So you are taking over, Honorable Minister, 
Uh, my question is, how do you intend to make the planning and development department functional? I was envisaged in a measure. What planning methodology are you going to adapt so that the figures you bring before us as a budget will reflect the developmental needs of our people? Thank you, Senator Brown. So on this, uh, as we've been doing some review across uh, the department, before we can achieve the process of request for separation mm -hmm. internally, the first thing is that people must be given their independence to function. And that's, that's something we, we found that was lost. Uh, you still have technicians within the Ministry of Finance who have the experience, and we believe we must work with them in addition with support from our international partners to strengthen the development planning piece of the ministry. So in the interim, as interim measure, once confirmed, we believe that's how we want to go in, identify the talents, identify the gaps, and then make sure where need be for assistance. We work with our international partners who have expressed the willingness to even to support us and move the development planning piece to a new level. Okay. Senator, may I? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Having served before as the Deputy Minister of Planning for Regional and Sectoral Planning, uh, one of the things I would like to suggest to this August body in this <clears throat> discussion is for us to consider, like the Minister said, elevating that function, maybe set up a planning commission. Because by merging it with the economic ease, like the two of you have indicated, you know, economic of policy and planning will continue to be highlighted because that's the main state of the Ministry of Finance. But then spatial planning and other kinds of planning you know, will be subjugated and that's what we've seen. So to me, it will be good to have you know, its own you know, a standalone fu functionality of government that is responsible for those aspects of planning, which is really very, very important. If you take zooming, for instance, it's one big problem that we have currently. You know, we have zoning, you know, there's a small uh, a unit in Ministry of Public Works, but that's not sufficient. See how Monrovia is expanding on all fronts towards the RIA and everywhere. There's absolutely no zoning. There's absolutely no city planning. So we do need a planning functionary of government, you know, that, you know, can be robustly equipped to be able to address these developmental concerns. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have two more questions. Um, if, if possible, if possible, if possible, let me let me ask them the, the, the two of them at the same time, and then you can. What has to do with Nokar, uh, the National Oil Corporation, something like the minister? You want to serve as a, I believe, I mean, you are, but as a minister, and by by act, you are a statutory member of the board, I believe. Uh, the reason why I'm asking you is, during your administration, we saw the collapse of the Um uh, I remember when we were doing the budgeting here, Nokar could not even afford to pay the final salaries and set and severance benefits to his employees. You had to make a presentation and we had to swallow a better pain to place those into the national budget. Now we heard recently that President Walker has, has named an interim head of the car. Honorable Minister, can you briefly comment on what circumstances led to the collapse of the car? And two, what has informed the President's decision? What is the financial vibrancy of the count now for which the president wants to name people there? How is the, what's the sovereignty of the count now? What are or what will be the solvents of this funding? The last question is, up to the 2023 elections, Liberia was enrolled into the IMF program. Our minister, I would like to know 
from you, uh, this new government. What is your position? What will be the position of the President Walker's administration as regards the IMF program? Are we, are we going to continue to enroll or are you going to discontinue? Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you yeah, so much. That's, that's it. Final questions. So please debrief here your answers, and then we'll take Senator DeLong, Senator Nupui, and Senator Taylor in chief in that order. Mr. Chair, Co Chair, uh, Honorable Senators, questions around why Nupa failed or uh, the circumstances around which uh, brought it to that stage. We all know in the context of uh, and in the context of a resource, I mean, a revenue generating entity. I, for one, we believe almost all SOEs going far, lessons of the past. Why it failed, we can go back to searching why it failed, and if need be, proceed with audit, and to make sure that issues that went wrong are identified, to learn the lessons, but in this, Current context as we speak, NOCAL is a vibrant institution associated with oil and wealth. And obviously, it must be an entity of focus to making sure uh, the appropriate uh, qualified, the appropriate structure, functions defined, and make it to be that entity that can be held liable in the future. And so, I would say, for NUCA and its operation, the decision by the president to appoint an officer in charge, that means an officer in charge until the appropriate uh, nomination is done to fill those vacancies. And it does not only apply to NUCA, so there are other <coughs> institutions where there will be officer in charge until full nomination is done. But one of the question for the IMF program, Obviously, an IMF program with this country is needed. As I indicated in my uh, 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 remarks, an IMF program should be complemented. In terms of marking out where we want resources to be spent, the IMF plays a catalytic role. What that means, a program with the IMF will be commissioned presidents for World Bank support, European Union support for our country. So certainly, we have been in some prior engagement just to make sure that we align and there's going to be a mission uh, hopefully soon and that mission will lay the groundwork for the new ECM program with the country as we speak and that will be some of the reasons why our development partners will further engage us and in the context we're looking for, for greater, greater, greater collaboration. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, Mr. Minister. That's it. We said at the beginning of this uh, hearing that the public will have the opportunity to channel uh, any question or constraint. So I would like to ask um, Senator Dobo, who is in charge of that, to let us know whether there's anything coming out of the public. Uh, Honorable Chair, Distinguished Senator, uh, we informed the Senate and to collect information from the public back here, uh, but we see no concern of the public. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll not take Senator Delong. Thank you. And he said the economy, the state of the economy of our country is 
in this person. But the hope of our people should be kept alive. In order to keep our people hope alive, the president has reposed confidence in the two of you, the two of you, to help you keep our lives. Please come and tell them. So our role here is to feed that. Now to my question. One, the president in the other message said that he would do drug tests. Because fighting drug is the key uh, priority of this administration. Will you do drug tests? Question two of you. Yes. I will do drug tests. Most certainly. Who said no? Who said no? What will you do that? What will you do that? And so that uh, they can inform our body. It's this commission. What will you do? When? In my case, I could do that as quickly as possible as I leave from here. Yeah, I could do that as quickly as possible as I leave from here. So for drug test from me, maybe we could even call the doctor. I would <laughs> We will make arrangements to do the drug test next week. Thank you. The both of you are on our own. I want you to remember this answer. Yes. Thank you. Can supply you the results if you want. It. Please do. Okay. Uh, Mr. I Our current evidence says that says one minute. Do you think have you done a suspect of the revenue uh, tables of our country? And do you think? That is realistic, understated, or we can grow our budget, our revenue, by sourcing places where revenue should be collected from, but we are, we are not putting our hands there for all the other reasons. Question. Uh, Senator, thank you. Um, I frankly believe that we can generate a lot more then was projected in the draft budget that was submitted, I think which was around 625 million. Right. I think we can do more than that. You know, there are places within our revenue generation system, like I said in my opening remark, that we can all work on you know, closing. There are some places that are waste, there are some abuse in the system, you know, there are revenue leakages. So we are not in that have limited time. Within 10 minutes, uh, I just want you to be very brief with your response. Okay. Our current envelope of uh, for 600 million, is it realistic? Is it understated? Can we grow our yes, I think it's, it's about 625 million from that. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, I think that is realistic. And then when we get in, we will work assiduously to see whether we can grow that. Did you do risk analysis or assessment to grow? Well, this thing is realistic, or there are other places people calling or hoping we can grow the revenue? Yes, I think that, you know, I spoke to the RICS folks at LRA, okay. and, but we need some investments because there's some constraints that they have. You know, so if we can invest in ensuring that we mitigate the risks that they have identified, you know. Then, yeah. uh, for example? Okay, an example is that some of our collection points are manually operated. Okay, because they have manual systems, it means the country relies on the individual discretion of that person who is reporting the tallies and all of that. If we deploy technology there, that can remove the individual discretion, and then that hopefully will carry things up. Also, the LRA piloted the deployment of fiscal devices. And I understand that, you know, a business, the business where it was targeted, I mean, where it was piloted is a small agrarian business. And the the uh, 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 
use of taxes that were generated previously what was a number of hundreds of dollars. Oh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, I just want to make more that. Okay, all right, all right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do you know about or do you about a company in at the Freeport? The what? About a company at okay. Freeport called CTM. Or have you done an assessment of what happened with at the port when it comes to doing cases at the port? All the bureaucracies and bottlenecks and all of these things. Have you done any analysis of that to know uh, to, to, to tell me what do you intend to do? What is it? CTM, some yeah, CTM. And uh, if you know about CTM, a CTM revenue went into the Ministry of Cultural and Development. Uh, Minister, I'm mean, sorry, Senator, I would like to ask your indulgence so that I will have to consult with any of my technicians and then I can get back to you. Uh, but let me assure you that under my leadership, you know, those are some of the things, if, if we identify such things as an inefficiency, then we'll, we'll be able to take the appropriate action. One of the things LRA has been proffering all along while here is a single window to make it easier for businesses to be able to pay their taxes as well as, you know, clear their cargo and all of that. So, so these are some of the places we'll be looking at. And if it is inefficient, and not doing what it's supposed to do to give our people the kind of relief that we need, we'll come back to you with recommendations for mitigation. Thank you. Uh, I will work, we will work with you okay. to review the task force okay. so that we see how we can some of the tax for you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Blessing, uh, you were Minister of Finance before. Uh, you operated. <laughs> They put your program like this. All right? Do you believe me after my program there? What's that? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I believe in program based budgeting and not itemized budget. What's the difference? The program based budgeting must be informed by performance as they associated with projects. For example, how do we are thinking in terms of just bringing meat to the national budget is to begin the process of peer marketing, say Kush as an example. Can we earmark in the national budget now to make sure that we get full traction to the recognition that Kush is, a, is an issue impacting on our people? So in the budget, include for a line item say for mental health. We we'll do for mental health. It lays a basis that clearly says government is interested in the people and addressing that matter for which it is not being earmarked. Also, earmarked, for example, is a public health. So, in those ways, they are addressing in a direct way program related uh, performance that you'll be holding people to account. Thank you. Sometimes when we ask questions, it sounds a little like we do it with Tessie and maybe it's time to attend the Okay. One minute. I'm checking the time. Go ahead. Checking the time. Go ahead. Thank you. Mr. Minister, you are checking the time. Thank you. 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 Is 129 million. 129 million. Part of the 129 million, the Ministry of Finance there, grant, payment for grant, or grant, foreign liability for instance, 20 million. Domestic debt. 74 million. Fiscal option says 74 million. If you put previous years back, it's almost half a billion that we pay in domestic debt. How are you going to treat domestic debt payment and the transparency will be to the street? Do you honor court commit to ensure that 
if you put just in ten dollar for domestic debt, that ten dollars must have been informed by a list. Do you commit on a court that there will be transparency for us to see that list? Question. Mr. Dillon, we do commit. And the first thing around that, when confirmed? If. We'll begin the process first of doing the audit to know exactly to whom payment was made in line with the budget for those previous years. That's the first thing. And in hence, in the context of enhancing transparency, we'll reintroduce the debt management committee in its full function. And the other layer that followed the debt management committee operation will be to reintroduce the economic management committee. Finally, budget performance report. Your commitment.
budget is presented in bulk. Uh, those monies are left at the discretion of uh, head of agencies to do development. And they direct development in areas that don't impact the lives of our people in the neighbor countries. What do you bring to the table? Because at this point in time, uh, as a Senate, and I'm pretty sure as uh, legislature, we are going to be focusing on doing budgeting in a way that directly impacts the lives of our people in the neighbor countries. What is the concept around that? Just take a note so that because of time. The my second point I'd like you to clarify. You serve as Minister of Finance before. Didn't you tell you how many different accounts uh, as subsidiary accounts to the conservative account that you have open at commercial banks? Could you clearly say to us how regularly uh, were these accounts reconciled and if there were problems? My third point has to do with the appropriation of the roof fund. The, we we appropriate in a national budget a box figure for roof fund, uh, which has been year in, year out. At this point in time, what would be your thinking in terms of setting aside a portion of this amount for particular roads in the respective countries, county by county? then also setting aside a portion for primary roads. Okay, then my fourth point has to do with uh, the workforce we should talk about. And as the president indicated, the workforce is around 70,000. 70, Are you going to downsize or right size the workforce? Do you have any plan to downsize or the right size? Because we are senators, if we are confirming you, we want to know uh, whether you want to do something like this. Because I'm quite, quite aware that when something like this starts, uh, everybody will be trooping here. So before we confirm you, I would like to know your thinking. How do you intend to get money for, or to concentrate more money and for infrastructure projects? You stated rightly, and as also the president said, that half, almost half of our revenue goes towards payroll, and you are concerned about infrastructure development. How do you intend to tweak the budget, or how do you intend to get additional resources to fund infrastructure development? Okay, so then I, I will come to the early authority. That will end my zero questions for you. Uh, honorable nominee, go Expo. I'm quite aware, I, I've been here at the Go Iron O. The minerals that are extracted and exported. How do you track as revenue authority? the quantity of mineral exported so that we get the appropriate taxes. Because I've heard that in many instances, taxes are compromised. Uh, the, uh, the right quantity is not being reported. How do you intend to address that? Petroleum product importation. We have seen in pass because there is a price structure for petroleum products. And at the end of it, the price is quoted. Say for instance, $5.80. Maybe for retail. I would uh, maybe emphasize retail. Or wholesale. That's a wholesale. We have seen in past where a particular importer is being able to sell far below the wholesale price and to still remain a viable business entity, whereas others who are competitors cannot sell below the wholesale price. 
and they are stopping in business. And what has been reported is that somebody was favored by high option regime and the taxes were being compromised. How do you intend to address that? At some point in time, I cannot, I think uh, that was in 2021. 20, uh, when I took seat as senator, I recall the Revenue Authority inaugurated the real estate pilot project in Miami. And I'm quite sure you are aware that that has been going on for almost 30 years in Miami. And the understanding was that every revenue generated was going to be shared with the county. To the best of my recollection, uh, no money has been appropriated from IGB uh, from this collection. How do you intend to address that going forward? And as a minister, I also like for you to speak to this. I like for you to please uh, check this also and see. Because in the next budget, I'm going to waste a means now, so I'm going to be checking. If you are sending a budget here, you collected revenue from MyGB, one of the real estate power projects. So they want to say that MyGB was going to get uh, a portion of that money. And every design in the project is going to be difficult for you to get my support. So I hope we can work collaboratively to ensure that my country interest is protected and I'll just benefit and give to our people for the development purposes. Uh, so far, uh, those are my concerns for now. Thank you, Thank you sir. So on the, concept, on the question regarding the concept, uh, we believe uh, greater, greater impact of development to the people as well as the county. Uh, take for example the re-establishment of uh, the road maintenance station uh, through public works. We, we think that as an example, that people could see tangible presence of government in counties through the regional setup. So we do that through public works allocation, and uh, that's just an example. So greater impact to the budget, empowering the relevant agencies. Take, for example, a list that we've been using before. Do we need to revisit how LIS has been doing it? And then just sit around the table and then reorganize it. Uh, to reflect the, the representation across the 15 county. And so these are just some talks that we'll have to sit and go with you on as to how we re-engage on those in terms of making sure our people see the impact. Uh, regarding uh, accounts, commercial bank accounts, at this point in time, I will not have a record before me to take full stock, but I know we've been in conversation on the single treasury account, just making sure that situations where there are accounts of government held outside, especially from the central bank. We want to make sure that we, we, we support the single treasury account uh, process and just make sure that that process of making everything in a way that is centralized and you can easily track for transparency, the better it is. Uh, in the context of the role fund, that's an area in terms of how we have proportion for feeder as well as primary role in the current context. We're talking about an estimated 1.5 billion that is needed, as has been shared with us from our public work colleagues. Uh, so that amount, this aggregator, what proportion goes for feeder role, what proportion goes for primary role, we all can sit and make sure that for me, the budget should be where these are reflected. And as we agree, certainly, in the context of right sizing, downsizing, at this point in time, my take on this, firstly, we must take complete stock as to where we are in terms of the, the workforce, especially in the public sector. And we, 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 will, we will support the idea for GSC that has done a very good work for 2018 to 2021 in terms of payroll and personnel audit completed for 2022 to December 2023. That will inform whether the 300 plus million wage bill is actually what it should be. That information will be relevant. And then we believe, I don't support public sector to be the place for job growth. Private sector should now be. So 
our engagement, especially in terms of infrastructure project as we engage our international partner, a lot of our national development plan. In agriculture, if we say we want to do rice, let's do rice for small farm water as an example, and the benefit it brings. Doing roads, that is an enabler that reduces the cost of transport across country. If we do roads well, it's going to be an enabler that further reduces constraint on prices and inflation. So uh, these are all areas for me. Uh, in the context of just making sure collection across palliative counties be reflected and make sure that due is, re is, is returned to the Brentford counties, we commit ourselves to doing that. Thank you, Senator Tiller. Senator Tiller. Oh, okay. Let me just do mine quickly. Yeah, uh, thank you, Senator Nukwe. Your first two questions to me point to leakages within our within our collection mechanism. Whether those are under declaration of mineral values or you know export numbers or under declaration of petroleum products, you know, or whatever shenanigans that goes on with those two. I can commit to you, Honorable Senator and to this August body that will ensure that those things will stop. They will stop. If there were privileged individuals who for no reason were giving special dispensations, we will review those dispensations and then we will go back to the authority, whether it's the presidency or whoever, and ensure that those things, the people are not cheated. What I would like to appeal to you on is that as we begin the stringent enforcement of closing these revenue leakages, uh, some of you may get calls, but please, we ask you to work with us, you know, because we say, you know, in like grand term, bad soul require bad blessing, you know. But I think that we can all work together seriously, and my leadership at the LRA will ensure that many of these acts of impropriety on the part of whether they're LRA folks or whether there are other folks in the society, we will do our best to curb all of them so that our people can get the you know, uh, highest dividend of our resources. Uh, regarding the revenue sharing piece, uh, the minister already answered that, so in the interest of time, Senator, if it's okay with you, uh, if that answer is adequate, then I think he already answered it. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair, and uh, I want to say thank you for the Honorable <coughs> Minister of Finance President. Uh, I have a few questions for you. Will you have a template to determine the ministry budget or you work with the period ministry to determine that budget? Minister of Finance. of the budget process will require you to engage all agencies of government in the context of what they bring to the budget. So obviously we want to make sure we will consult. With the yes. Bureau of Ministry. Yes. I'm asking that question because most of the time when we call the ministry to answer to all as to why they are on a platform, they will say to all they were not in the crafting of the budget. And so the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Finance, only give them up to you and compare the world. That has been a very major problem here. Money given to I and mean, paid by concessions in the country to your finance ministry. And most of the time we have problems that <coughs> when my money is paid to the finance ministry to remain to the company budget, to the country account, we do not receive it on time. Will you give the country's money on time? Obviously, yes. yes. That's I so, know. 